Okay, so today and then next lecture, we'll be talking about things that are going to challenge the way that you think that the world works. Um, and so that's a good thing. Uh, so first we're going to talk about special relativity. And then next lecture we'll talk about quantum mechanics. And so special relativity deals with things traveling. at or near the speed of light. Or I guess maybe I shouldn't say near, but. At high speeds. So obviously the speed of light is the fastest speed that you can go. So if you're traveling at the speed of light, then you're definitely going to be experiencing what we're going to be talking about. But uh, as we'll discuss, this will even happen for things like satellites orbiting the Earth. So you need to be fairly high speed. So it's not something that we experience in our everyday life, which is why we don't have the intuition for how it works. But it is thing. it is something that has effects that uh, do shape how the world works, like uh, GPS satellites need relativistic corrections in order to accurately communicate with the ground, for example. Okay, so I'll start off with the two of the big concepts, and then we'll derive uh, where these concepts come from. So the first one is time dilation. And so there's two ways to think about this. So if you are the So if you're traveling very fast, in your frame of reference, time, well, let's see how best to work this. Others, will perceive your time passing more slowly. And in the example, you'll see exactly what this means, but uh, kind of to explain if so, if you had one person on earth and one person out in a spaceship that was traveling very fast. And let's say they both started their watch at the same time. The person on the earth would measure one time and the person in the spaceship would read their time. And those times would not agree with each other. And it would appear that the person in the spaceship, their time is moving slower when compared to the person on the earth. Uh, so that's what we mean by time dilation. And then the other thing is length contraction. So again, if you're traveling really fast, Let's say you're in a spaceship, then things outside of the spaceship will 
So, oh. your length would appear smaller or shorter to an outside observer. But then if you think about it from the point of view of you being on the ship, then uh, for the time dilation part, you, you think the time is happening normally and that everyone else is just moving really slow or no. Everyone else is moving faster compared to what you would expect. And then for length contraction, when you're in the spaceship, it seems like everything else has stretched itself out. So like the dilation and the contraction are from the point of view of someone who is observing someone else moving very quickly. But then from the point of view of the person who's moving very quickly, it's the opposite of that. So you have to pay attention to who is the observer and whether or not they're moving. And so these, you'll see this in an example now. So let's say that you have one person who's down on the earth and one person who's up in a spaceship that's orbiting the earth. So of course, since the spaceship is orbiting, it's moving at some velocity. And let's say that you set up an experiment where you have a light source and it goes up and it hits a mirror and then it comes back down and you have some detector. So there's a distance D, or I guess the, the distance from the light source to the mirror is, we'll call that capital D. And then you have some astronaut who has measured the time uh, that it takes to go from the light source to the detector. And they measure that time as T zero. So this is astronaut time. And so just doing some simple math, the distance that the light traveled would be 2D because it goes up to the mirror and then back down. And the speed that that the speed of light is just C. So this is just rewriting the definition of velocity, which is delta X over delta T. So from the point of view of the spaceship, this is what has happened. From the point of view of Earth, While this is all happening, the spaceship is moving. So here's your spaceship. And here's where the light was originated. But the spaceship moves in the time that it takes 
for the light to hit the detector. And so from the earth, it appears as though the light has traveled this distance S or 2S, I guess. And that's because the spaceship has traveled this distance L and we can calculate L as long as we know what the velocity of the spaceship is. And the time that it took to do this. And so if we wanted to measure the uh, so just like we did over here when we use v equals delta x over delta t, if we do the same thing over here and we just replace c, the velocity with c, uh, the distance that the light traveled is 2s. And it did that over time delta t. So does anyone have any questions about this picture? Okay. So now our goal on the next slide is going to be to calculate this S. And so to do that, we're gonna use this triangle. And so the vertical distance that the light traveled is D. So it's the same capital D that we used in the previous part. And then the, this side length is going to be B delta T over two. And so if we have a right triangle and we have two of the sides and we want to calculate the third side, what equation are we going to use? Yeah, we'll use Pythagorean theorem. So this was our right triangle, D, B delta T over two, and then S. So S squared equals D squared plus B squared delta T squared. So now we're going to use the two definitions that we wrote down for the time that the astronaut measured and then the time that the person on the Earth measured. So remember, the zero was for astronaut time. And the T without the zero was for Earth time. 
So we're going to rearrange the earth time equation to get S by itself. And then we're going to plug that in over here. And then we're going to rearrange this equation to isolate D. So it'll look this. So if we square all these things, and then I'm just going to multiply everything by four to get rid of all those fours in the denominator. Now we've got two terms that have delta T in them. So let's group those together. C squared delta T squared minus B squared delta T squared. T zero squared C squared. So we can factor out the delta t squared, and then you get c squared minus v squared equals t0 squared c squared. We're going to take this equation and move it to the next slide. So I'll give you guys a minute to catch up. But so far, I haven't done anything crazy, right? I've just basically done this equation a couple of times, which is just the definition of velocity. And then I plugged it into a Pythagorean theorem. So this is all stuff that you guys have seen. Okay, so we'll take that equation. So now I'm going to divide the C squared to the other side. And then if we put that one over C squared inside the parentheses, we get one minus B squared over C squared. And so now we could take a square root if we wanted to and then we would get an expression. That allows us to relate 
the astronaut time to the time on Earth. And so you might also see it written this way. And then instead of writing this square root of one minus v squared over c squared, uh, we invent a new variable called gamma that lets us write this much quicker. So this is the final equation for time dilation. And then we have this definition for gamma, which is one over square root of one minus b squared over c squared. So any questions about this? So we'll talk about the like how we look how to look at this mathematically and how this relates to the time dilation we were talking about earlier. So if there's no questions, then we'll move on to that. So we have this equation. Oh, I dropped. Substitute. So this was not the wrong way. Okay. So the gamma goes with the the T zero. Okay. And then we saw that gamma was this. So now using what we know about velocity and the speed of light, uh, what can we say about gamma? So if we look at this part, v squared over c squared, what do we know about v in relationship to c? Can v ever be bigger than c? No, right, so V has to be less than or equal to C. And so this thing has to be less than or equal to one. What happens when V is equal to C? Yeah, it's one. So then you have one minus one, which is zero. And then what's one divided by zero? It's bad. <laughs> so, so when, 
B equals C, gamma goes to one over square root of one minus one, which equals one over zero, which goes to infinity. So when you're traveling at the speed of light, things get very weird. And so most things don't travel at the speed of light, but we know that photons do. And so there's a lot of weird implications to what this means for photons. So the This equation at the top is supposed to tell us how we convert the time that we measure into the time of whatever it's moving. So if in our time, I said it took one second for a photon to travel some distance. In the frame of reference of the photon, We we're multiplying by an infinity now. So like the, the consequence of this is that photons and things that are traveling at the speed of light don't experience any time. Like from their point of view, basically everything has stopped and they're just moving around freely. Or from the point of view of someone who's not moving at the speed of light, the photons are like, you can think of it as eternal or immortal. Like, obviously if they interact with something, then the photons can change. But if they were just able to fly through space freely, then they're not really experiencing time. So they're, they're not going to decay or anything like that. There's some weird stuff going on when you get to the speed of light. Uh, as we'll see later, uh, something that has mass is incapable of traveling at the speed of light. So that's not something that we will ever need to worry about. So that was the limit when the velocity was equal to the speed of light. But what happens when the velocity is much, much smaller than the speed of light. So what happens if you're traveling at normal human speeds? Okay. So if the velocity is much, much smaller than the speed of light, then we're gonna take a small number and divide it by a big number. So that would make this go to zero. And so when you plug that in, you would get one over square root of one minus zero, which just gives you one. And so this is the non-relativistic limit. And so this just describes everyday life. So when you plug it into the equation, when gamma is one, then you just get that your, your watches would agree with each other. Like when I'm in a car, my watch reads one time and when somebody's out on the road, their watch would read the same time. So this is important because our this new framework that we've developed has to be consistent with what we know from our everyday experiences. And so in this limit, when your velocity is much, much less. So far we've seen time dilation and now let's look at length contraction. So in the interest of time, I won't derive the whole uh, formula. Uh, and so I'll just write it down. 
So the L with the zero subscript is the rest length. Which you can think about as the length of the object at rest or the length that you would measure the object if you were moving at the same velocity as the object. And then this would be the observed length. And so when we compare that to the time dilation equation, we would see that the in the time dilation, the gamma is in the numerator with the rest time or proper time. But in the length contraction equation, the gamma term is in the denominator. So again, gamma is this one over square root of one minus b squared over c squared. And so we should do our check. If v is much, much less than c, then gamma equals one. And in that case, you just get L equals L zero over gamma goes to L equals L zero. So as long as things are not moving relativistically, then we all agree that the length is the same, whether we're in a car or on the side of the road. So this effect only becomes important when we are moving very, very quickly. So when we talk about reference frames, you might also see them written as inertial reference frames. And so this was one of Einstein's insights that basically if you are stationary or moving at a constant velocity, then without an external frame of reference, you can't tell these two things apart, these two conditions. So the thought experiment for this is imagine that you're in a spaceship that has no windows or anything. If you're in that spaceship and you can't see outside, then there's no way for you to know whether you're moving at a constant speed or if you're stationary. So when we talk about inertial reference frames, what we're saying is that uh, like in the previous examples, the astronaut was moving at some constant velocity. They couldn't tell, like from their point of view, they can't tell if they're moving or if they're stationary. Then from the Earth, looking at the spaceship, we could see that it was moving. And so we have our reference frame where we're stationary and the spaceship is moving, 
And then from the spaceship's point of view, if they did have windows, they might think I'm stationary and the earth is moving. So if you do all of that kind of math, it'll turn out that those two situations are interchangeable. Now, this is only for things that are moving at constant velocity. And the further thought experiment that Einstein did was that as soon as you add in accelerations into this mix, then even if you don't have windows in your spaceship, you would still know whether or not you were accelerating. And so that gets into general relativity. Uh, which we probably don't have time to talk about for this class. So we have to keep pay attention to these different reference frames. So, uh, and it's fine if you don't know who's moving and who's stationary. Uh, you just need to say, I'm going to take my reference frame as the stationary one, and whatever I think is moving is going to be moving. So you just have to pick one to call the stationary or one to call the moving frame and it's fine but it doesn't necessarily matter which one you pick because you'll see that the results are interchangeable okay so now how do we deal with having these different reference frames so if you think about uh like let's say you were in a car or on a boat and let's ignore wind resistance for now. And you were to throw a ball, uh, let's say that your boat is moving this way at some velocity V. and you throw a ball at some velocity u that's also forward. From your point of view, how fast would the ball u be moving? Or how fast would the ball be moving? I guess I kind of gave it away. So from your reference frame, so I'll call this, I'll just call this A. So from reference frame A, the ball is moving at velocity U. But now let's say I'm over on the land here, I'm person B. What velocity would I think the ball is moving at? Okay, so it will involve the velocity of the boat. About the velocity that the person threw it with. Yeah, so in our point, in our experiences and non relativistic cases, we would say that the ball is moving at speed u plus v, right? So I guess I'll call this U prime and we'll see why in a second. So the total velocity of the ball here is U 
and then the total velocity of the ball here is just u prime, or sorry, the total velocity u of the ball in case b was u prime plus v, and the in the frame of reference of the person on the boat, it was just u prime. So this is called the Galilean transformation. And it's going to turn out for relativistic motion that this is not true. So the Galilean transformation is actually just an approximation. It's a very good approximation that works for our normal lives where we don't move at relativistic speeds. But for relativistic cases, you need the Lorentz transformation. So for relativistic motion, so if the boat was moving at a relativistic speed and you threw a ball off the boat, then the velocity of the ball would look like this. So it'll look kind of similar to the gamma term that we had earlier. So we still have the, the top part here is the expected Galilean transformation. But now we have this whole denominator term that's different. And so if we do the same thing that we did before, where we say, well, what if the velocity and like the velocity of the boat and the velocity that we threw uh, the ball at, what if they were not relativistic? So what if V U prime is much, much less than C squared? Then you would get one plus v u prime over c squared. So this term would just go to zero. And what you would be left with would be the expected Galilean transformation. So just like with the time dilation, when we're not doing relativistic motion, then this Lorentz transformation just turns back into the kind of transformation that we expect. And so to kind of motivate this from another way, if I were on a spaceship and I was traveling at relativistic speeds and I were to shine a flashlight in front of the spaceship, if you were to just do a Galilean transformation, then even if the spaceship was moving like 0.1 times the speed of light, if you just added the velocities together, you would get the speed of light, which would be one times C, and then you would add another 0.1 C, so you would get a total of 1.1 times the speed of light. But that contradicts what we said previously, where we said that the speed of light was the fastest that something could travel. So if you tried to use the Galilean transformation, now you're immediately breaking the rule that you established that the speed of light is the fastest that you can go. But instead, if we use this Lorentz transformation, uh, then we would see that even if, unless we are uh, exactly traveling at the speed of light, then this Lorentz transformation will make it so that we're always going to be traveling. We won't be able to exceed the speed of light for our velocity. 
So maybe I'll just, yeah, I up. So uh, there's also a relativistic correction for momentum and energy. So we've seen momentum written like this. So this would be non-relativistic. And so to make this relativistic, we just stick that gamma factor in front. And when we're non-relativistic, gamma just goes to one. And so these two things become equal to each other. So that's for correcting momentum. For correcting energy, it's a bit more complicated. And the final result will look like this. If we set the momentum equal to zero or basically make the object stationary, then we get this equation. And you see, if you take the square root of both sides, then you get the famous E equals MC squared equation. And so this is telling you that even at rest, objects have a rest energy. And so this is the underpinning for how we can make nuclear reactions happen. We can change we can change something that has mass into energy, basically. Or conversely, you could also change something that has energy into mass. Another application for relativistic effects and one that especially has applications in astronomy is the Doppler effect. And so the Doppler effect is what causes ambulances to uh, sound higher pitched when they're moving towards you and lower pitched when they're moving away from you. And that's the Doppler effect for sound. And there's a similar Doppler effect for uh, light as well. But because light moves at the speed of light, there are relativistic implications that we have to deal with. So the observed wavelength of light is equal to the emitted wavelength of light times the square root factor, one plus V over C divided by one minus V over C. So it looks kind of similar to the gamma correction that we were using earlier. Uh, and so now let's see what this means. So in words, if something moves towards you, it's going to be blue shifted. And if something moves away from you, it's going to be red shifted. And so let's take a look at that. So in the case where something's moving towards you, we'll call that velocity negative. So the velocity is less than zero. Uh, when you plug that into this square root, you get 
So you get one minus some uh, value that's less than one. Uh, so you'll get, say, for example, 0 0.9 on top. And then in the denominator, when v is less than 0, so it's negative, then you have two negative signs that become a positive sign. And so you would get something bigger than 1. And then you would take that square root. So taking the square root of something that's less than 1 will give you a number that's less than one. If we take a number that's less than one and multiply it by, so like uh, a wavelength, if you take a wavelength, say 500 nanometers and multiply it by something less than one, then it's going to have a, an observed wavelength that's less than its emitted wavelength. And we call that blue shifted because if we were looking at visible light, then if things are shifted towards the blue end of the visible spectrum, then their wavelengths are shorter. So maybe I can include blue shifted means wavelength shorter, or the observed wavelength is shorter. And then the opposite is true for the something moving away from you, something moving away from you, then the numerator becomes some number bigger than one, the denominator becomes some number smaller than one. So when you divide something bigger than one by something smaller than one, you still get something bigger than one. Then taking the square root, you still get something bigger than one. If you multiply that by your wavelength, say 500 nanometers, then the observed wavelength is going to be 500 times some number bigger than one which gives you an observed wavelength that's longer than your emitted wavelength. And so the, uh, just like with the blue shifted, because the red part of the spectrum is longer wavelengths, we call light that is shifted to a longer wavelength, red shifted. 